President? The Senator from Utah. I thank my good colleague, and uh, I've enjoyed listening to his comments. Uh, Mr. President, one thing people admire about firefighters is that when others are running away from a burning building, they run toward it. Conversely, while most people prudently avoid cliffs, President Obama and the Congressional Democrat leadership are racing to over the fiscal cliff, Thelma and Louise style. And uh, here we go. Absent action by Congress and leadership by the President at the end of the year, almost every federal income taxpayer in America will see an increase in their rates. Some will see a rate increase of 9 percent, while others will see a rate increase of 87 percent. Though not often discussed, and though the President likes to avoid discussing it, the impact of these rate hikes will have a uniquely damaging impact on small businesses and the jobs that they provide. Small businesses are the engine of jobs creation in our economy. And the rate hikes uh, the President insists on will hit them hard, undermining economic growth and hampering innovation and job creation. Whether we go over the fiscal cliff or whether the President gets his way on raising taxes, tax rates that is, taxes will go up significantly on small businesses. The President would like us to think <coughs> that raising these taxes is no big deal. It will just hit people who already have a lot of money and who can, quote, afford, unquote, to give a little more. As Pre President Obama put it in uh, using his own finances as an example, Absent tax increases, quote, I'm able to keep hundreds of thousands of dollars in additional income that I don't need, unquote. With due respect, this is an amazingly naive understanding of tax rates and their impact on economic growth. It assumes that all of the people hit by these higher tax rates are wealthy wage earners, CEOs, and financiers. It completely neglects the impact on small business income that will be subject to these individual rate hikes. Here we are at Christmas time, and uh, the Democrats want Santa to put coal in the socks of all the small business people. Even President Obama acknowledges that two thirds of the new jobs in our economy are created by small businesses, and the vast majority of small businesses are organized as flow through businesses, or what we call flow through business entities such as partnerships, S-corporations, limited liability companies, and sole proprietorships. In other words, these small businesses pay the individual income tax rates. Because the vast majority of small businesses are flowed through business entities, the income from these businesses flow, flows through the business directly onto the, uh, to the small business owner's individual tax returns. Therefore, any increase in individuals' tax rates means those small businesses get hit with a tax increase. This tax increase lands on those small business owners even if they do not take one penny out of their business profits. And they put it all back in to be able to hire more people or to get more inventory or whatever that helps their business along. Even if a small business reinvest all of its income to hire more workers, pay the workers they already have, or purchase equipment, they would still get hit with this looming tax hike. The President and those in his uh, party who support these rate hikes owe it to the American people to explain why their proposal will not adversely impact small businesses and those that depend on them for their livelihoods. Because the data suggests that the impact will be severe, there's no question about that. Why can't we uh, get the real facts here? First, according to the Con Congressional Budget Office, 80 percent of the revenue loss from extending the 2001 and 2003 tax relief provisions is found among those making less than $200,000 per year if single and $250,000 if married, the President's threshold. Second, the nonpartisan official score for, scorekeeper for Congress on tax issues, the Joint Committee on Taxation tells us that 53 percent of all flow through business income would be subject to the President's proposed tax hikes. 53 percent. This is our Joint Committee of Taxa on Taxation, which is a nonprofit 
excuse me, is a nonpartisan uh, committee. 53% of all flow through business income is subject to tax hikes on the top two rates. Well, given the agreed upon importance of small business to our economic recovery, it is a mystery to me why the president and his Democratic allies would pursue tax increases on these job creators. We simply cannot afford to raise taxes on over half of all this small business income. President Obama and congressional Democrats defend their plan by claiming that only 3% of small businesses would get hit with this tax increase. So we should not fear in raising taxes on them. However, they are misreading the Joint Committee on Taxation letter on this issue. That letter only talks about the percentage of taxpayers affected, not the percentage of businesses affected. For instance, if 10 people own one business, President Obama and congressional Democrats count that one business as 10 businesses when they make their statement about a small percentage of businesses affected. Obviously, that is not the right way to look at this. The truth is that they don't know what percentage of businesses they are proposing to raise taxes on, and what's worse, they don't really seem to care. The IRS publishes its statistics of income data on its web website, providing the most recent available tax data, which is currently tax year 2010. According to that official IRS data, when looking at the entire United States, 21% of owners of S corporations and partnerships, including limited liability companies, make $200,000 or more. Since President Obama's proposed rate hikes occur on singles making $200,000 or more and married couples making $250,000 or more, the vast majority of this 21% would get hit with a tax increase. The only portion of this 21% of S corporation and partnership owners that would not be hit with a tax hike are those that are married and make between $200,000 and $250,000. According to a 2011 Ernst & Young study entitled The Flow Through Business Sector and Tax Reform, citing 2007 data from the U.S. Census Bureau, over 44 million workers employed by S corporations and partnerships, including limited liability companies, that is over 60% of the 69 million employees that work for flow through businesses, are going to get hurt. So almost 21% of S corporation and partnership owners will be subject to the tax hikes on the top two rates. And over 64% of the workers in flow through businesses are found in these types of businesses. And this is before we even consider the impact on owners of sole proprietorships, which employ the remaining 36% of employees in the flow through sector. So when the federal government takes an additional 5% of the money that these small businesses earn, the effects are clear. Far from this being, as the president suggests, money uh, business owners don't need, it will in fact lead to lost jobs, stagnant or reduced wages, and a decrease in investment. The president campaigned on raising the top rates, and he seems bent on doing so. But he owes it to the American families to come clean about the impact these hikes on the economy uh, will have on the economy and on jobs. He should come clean and just admit that his desire for redistribution trumps all other considerations. The debate over the fiscal cliff has been quite discouraging for me. The president knows why it is that Republicans support full extension of current tax policy. And it is not because we are trying to defend the so-called rich. It is because we have a genuine and empirically grounded concern about the impact of marginal tax rates on small businesses, the jobs they create, and the men, women, and families that depend on them. I could care less about the truly rich. Instead of acknowledging that marginal rate hikes would have an outsized impact on small businesses, the president has decided instead to demagogue this issue, paint Republicans as out of touch, and put political points ahead of jobs. It is well past time for a grown-up conversation about tax policy. Our door remains open, and we look forward to having the president walk through it. Mr. President, I'd also like to take a few minutes to discuss a matter of great importance in the trade arena. 
Last week, the Senate approved legislation granting permanent normal trade relations to Russia and Moldova by a vote of 92 to 4. Such a strong vote would not have been possible without bipartisan cooperation from my Senate colleagues. I would once again like to express my appreciation to all the Republican members of the Finance Committee who worked with me and my staff in good faith to develop a strong enforcement package which addresses many of the concerns we all have with our bilateral trade relations with Russia. I also want to again express my appreciation for the hard work and cooperation of Senator Baucus, the chairman of the committee, of the Finance Committee. The process we undertook in the Finance Committee is emblematic of how the Finance Committee should work. It is my sincere hope that this will be a model for future legislation. Unfortunately, things don't always work so smoothly. In fact, I was quite disturbed to receive a letter earlier this week from Ambassador Kirk, our trade ambassador, informing me that the Obama administration tends to support approval of the proposed terms for Tajikistan, for Tajikistan's accession, and the invitation for Tajikistan to become a member of the WTO at the upcoming WTO General Council meeting. Now, let me be clear. I support efforts to help advance the rule of law by bringing countries such as Tajikistan into the World Trade Organization. What disturbs me is that the administration had been negotiating the WTO accession package for over a year and failed to even mention it to anyone on the Senate Finance Committee. Even more troubling is the fact that the final WTO Working Party meeting took place on October 26, 2012, at which Tajikistan's uh, proposed protocol of accession was completed. Yet no one in the Senate received any information about the accession until last week. Why the Obama administration waived five additional weeks, or waited five additional weeks, after co completing Tajikistan's WTO accession negotiations before notifying the committee is really a mystery to me. For an administration that touts its commitment to transparency and unprecedented consultations with Congress, their failure to consult with the Finance Committee and the Senate on the terms of Tajikistan's proposed accession protocol reveals that the administration's bold pronouncements about their excellent consultations are nothing more than empty rhetoric. Moreover, Section 122 of the Uruguay Round, of, Round Agreements Act requires the administration to consult with the Senate Committee on Finance before any vote is taken by the WTO relating to the accession of a new member. While sending, to, sending a letter to the committee a mere week before a vote is taken in the WTO and after the terms of the accession are already contemplated might technically comply with the letter of the law, it in no way complies with the spirit of the law. Had Congress been notified of Tajikistan's pending inv invitation to join the WTO earlier, it might have been possible to include provisions granting Tajikistan permanent normal trade relations along with the Russia and Moldova bills. But that was not possible. In fact, the Obama administration's lack of transparency and failure to meaningful, meaningfully consult with Congress rendered that impossible. As we continue to try to work with the Obama administration to develop policies and advance legislation which create economic growth and open new markets for U.S. workers and job creators, the administration must engage in meaningful consultations. Accordingly, I would expect that the way that the Tajikistan accession has been handled by the Obama administration will be an exception and not the norm regarding future consultations. To help ensure that is the case, I will soon be sending a letter to the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative with some detailed questions regarding their consultations with Congress and the private sector trade advisory committees. It is vitally important that we bring more transparency to this process, so I sincerely hope we receive a detailed and substantive response soon. I also hope we can soon begin to have a meaningful discussion with the administration about their plans for renewing trade promotion authority. As most of my colleagues know, Trade Promotion Authority is an important tool which helps us pry open foreign markets to U.S. exports. Every president since FDR has sought Trade Promotion Authority from Congress. Despite its critical importance, 
The administration keeps putting off any meaningful discussion of renewal. In fact, when Ambassador Kirk testified before the Finance Committee last March, I offered to sit down with him that day to start talking about TPA renewal. He declined my offer. Instead, he simply said that he would be happy to sit down and talk with me and members of the Finance Committee about TPA renewal, quote, at the appropriate time, unquote. Since that time, there has been no administration dialogue with me or with the Finance Committee about TPA, even though the Obama administration intends to include the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations and conclude those by uh, October of next year. And it's considering launching negotiations for a free trade agreement with the European Union as early as next month. Frankly, both of these initiatives are going to require TPA in order to be successful. While TPA should have been renewed long ago, we currently cannot wait any longer. If these trade initiatives are going to succeed, we cannot continue to keep putting them off. Mr. President, time uh, for the administration to start meaningful consultations with Congress and TPA renewal is now. And I'd, I'd like to see more cooperation. In this Congress, we've seen the Korean Free Trade Agreement, we've seen the Colombian Free Trade Agreement, and we've seen the Panamanian Free Trade Agreement. We've seen the PNTR with Russia, Permanent Normal Trade Relations with Russia. Those wouldn't have happened if we hadn't been pushing on the Finance Committee to get them done. The, it's, in my opinion, the administration had been slow walking all of those. Now those mean balance of trade positives for our, for our companies here in America. And I hate to see us playing around in deleterious ways with these type of uh, agreements. And so I've suggested some other agreements here that need to be entered into. We need to get real on international trade. We need to be able to compete with anybody in this world, and we are able to if we're given the chance. Mr. President, uh, I yield the floor.